Hello, my name is Joanne Fabuza from the Division of Colon and Rectal Surgery at Boston Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for allowing me to present, Is This Just an Abscess or Necrotizing Fasciitis? How to Manage Acute Perianal Sepsis. I have no disclosures. In this session on anal rectal emergencies, I will focus on distinguishing anal rectal abscess from a necrotizing soft tissue infection of the perianal perineal area, which can lead to life-threatening sepsis and often death. I will address the microbiology, risk factors, clinical features, diagnosis, and treatment of perianal sepsis. The etiology of anal rectal abscess is that the abscess results from obstruction of anal crypts or glands, which leads to stasis and often infection. The diagnosis of anal rectal abscess is based on the patient's history and physical examination. Perianal pain and swelling are common with superficial abscess, whereas drainage and fever occur less often. Inspection of the anal rectal area and perineum may reveal superficial erythema and fluctuance with tenderness to palpation, as shown in the photo in this slide. Anal rectal abscesses are defined by the anatomic space in which they develop. Abscesses are class classically divided into four categories. A perianal or subcutaneous abscess is superficial, typically visible on external inspection, and do not usually extend into any deep rectal or pelvic space. An ischial rectal abscess traverses the external anal sphincter and extends into the ischial rectal space. Intersphincteric abscesses are contained between internal and external anal sphincters and are often not visible on inspection. Superlevator abscesses are proximal to the internal anal sphincter and are not visible on external inspection. The primary treatment of abscess remains incision and drainage. The addition of antibiotics for an uncomplicated abscess without cellulitis in a healthy individual is not recommended. However, selective use of antibiotics for patients with complicated cellulitis, systemic illness, or immunosuppression is advised. Although the incidence of necrotizing infections is low, anal rectal abscesses or any perianal perineal insult or trauma can result in a necrotizing soft tissue infection, which rapidly destroys the fascia and subcutaneous tissue, usually without muscle necrosis. Fournier's gangrene is a polymicrobial infection of the perineal and urogenital region that manifests as a rapidly progressing necrotizing fasciitis. The synergistic action of aerobic and anaerobic organisms plays a major role in the progressive course of the infection, leads to an inflammatory response that spreads to the fascia with resultant obliterative endarteritis thrombosis of the cutaneous vessels, and tissue necrosis. The characteristic features of necrotizing fasciitis are rapid tissue damage, systemic toxicity, and if there is a delay in treatment, severe morbidity and mortality. The mortality, despite modern standard of care, remains between 20 to 30 percent. Early recognition of these necrotizing infections is imperative. Patients who develop necrotizing infections or Fournier's gangrene typically have risk factors. For example, immunosuppressed patients such as those with diabetes, cirrhosis, neutropenia, or HIV, a known malignancy, or long-term administration of corticosteroids all predispose a patient to developing such infections. Diabetes is especially implicated and is present in approximately 65% of affected patients. Other risk factors include penetrating trauma, a recent surgery, any skin or mucosal breach, such as that from hemorrhoids, fissures, insect bites, or even an episiotomy. Depending upon the etiology, there are two types of necrotizing infections. Type 1 is of polymicrobial origin, while type 2 is due to monomicrobial infection. 
In the majority of cases, aerobic and anaerobic bacteria are involved as a result of anorectal or urogenital trauma or infections such as Fornia's gangrene. The synergistic effect of the bacteria can result in fulminant gangrene, multi-system organ failure, and death. These infections are typically seen in older adults, typically male, and diabetics. Type 2 infections are monomicrobial in nature and often caused by streptococci or staphylococci. They are found usually in healthier patients with the history of some trauma, surgery, burn, laceration, or intravenous drug use. The time from initial onset to fulminant necrosis of necrotizing soft tissue infections can be anywhere from two to seven days. Depending on the degree of progression, patients may present with a wide range of symptoms from erythema and edema to crepitus to skin boli or frank necrosis. Patients typically will present with pain out of proportion to the examination. In addition to systemic manifestations such as fever and tachycardia, laboratory findings typically seen include leukocytosis along with neutrophilia, electrolyte imbalances such as hyponatremia and hyperglycemia, elevated inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate, as well as creatinine and lactate, may also be noted and indicate the severity of illness. A novel diagnostic scoring system, known as the Laboratory Risk Indicator for Necrotizing Fasciitis, is routinely used for the evaluation of severe soft tissue infections. There are six criteria, white blood cell count, hemoglobin, sodium, glucose, creatinine, and CRP, assigning each of them a point value from zero to four. A score greater than six has a sensitivity of approximately 90% and specificity of approximately 95% in diagnosing necrotizing fasciitis. A score less than six, however, does not rule out the diagnosis. If the suspicion is high for necrotizing soft tissue infection or fasciitis, such as if the patient has crepitus or necrosis on examination, there is a rapid progression of clinical manifestations, immediate surgical consultation and treatment is necessary, even without imaging. If imaging is performed, plain radiographs may show subcutaneous emphysema However, this finding is highly specific to Clostridia species. A CT, as shown in this slide, is more sensitive but lacks the specificity. It can reveal fluid collections, tissue stranding, and gas formation. Early recognition is key, and the gold standard for diagnosis is surgery. The increased time from admission to debridement and inadequacy of initial debridement have repeatedly been associated with increased mortality. The key tenet of treatment is surgical debridement of all necrotic tissue in a necrotizing soft tissue infection. The excision should extend to healthy bleeding tissue to all margins and often needs to be carried significantly beyond the area of skin changes because subcutaneous disease is usually much greater than can be appreciated on the skin examination. Frequent debridements are performed every one to two days until all necrotic tissue is removed. Intraoperative culture should be obtained to help tailor antibiotics. Tissue biopsy, although not required, will show tissue destruction, thrombosis of blood vessels, bacteria, and infiltra infiltration of acute inflammatory cells. Antibiotic therapy should be broad to cover activity against gram-positive, gram-negative, and anaerobic bacteria. A commonly accepted regimen includes piperacillin tazobactam plus vancomycin in addition to clindamycin. After the results of gram stain culture and sensitivity are available, the antibiotic coverage can then be narrowed. Antibiotics are typically continued until no further debridements are needed and the patient is hemodynamically stable. Necrotizing infections of the perineum or Fournier's gangrene are unique because of their proximity to the anus. Debridement in this area and subsequent wound care can often be difficult due to stool, stool spillage and soilage. For this reason, patients with perineal soft tissue infections often require diverting colostomies. 
In addition, multiple studies have examined the use of hyperbaric oxygen with mixed results. Hyperbaric oxygen is thought to have a direct antibacterial effect on anaerobic bacteria, decrease endotoxins, and optimize ph phagocytic function, as well as promoted wound healing. Early studies suggested a mortality benefit with hyperbaric oxygen. However, larger studies have found no difference in mortality. With the lack of proven benefit from hyperbaric oxygen, it should only be used in patients who are stable and when surgery is not delayed. In conclusion, uh, perineal soft tissue infections require prompt recognition. Delay in treatment leads to a high mortality rate. The treatment urgent radical surgical debridement is imperative, as well as frequent tape backs to ensure no further spread of necrotizing infection. Antibiotics should be tailored appropriately based on cultures and continued until no further evidence of infection in the patient is hemodynamically stable. Thank you.